One of the things that gets me really excited is when tools become more accessible to more people. So when Aperture announced the new Amaran lineup in December, I was even more excited than I was for the announcement of the 600D or the Nova, two lights that have become indispensable parts of my kit. Today, we're going to take a look at the Aperture Amaran 200D, the surprise light that came out of nowhere. And it's compatible with Citus Link. At $299, the 200D is a lot of light per dollar. Aperture also offers a version called the 200X that's bicolor at $349, but uh, this light is actually a bit brighter than the bicolor version, and I wanted to try the one that had the most output. Now, I didn't have the extra cash to get the 100D as well, but there's only two differences of note. Uh, one, the output, and two, the fan. But everything else you can pretty much assume is the same. Oh, uh, that reminds me. I bought this with my own money. Aperture didn't send me anything, and all views expressed in this video are my own. All right, so let's just quickly go over what you actually get in the box. So we'll get this open and take a look at what's inside. There we go. So you have the Aperture stickers that come with it. It also comes with an instruction manual, but uh, I already lost mine. And like my father before me, I don't need it anyway. So here we've got our hyper reflector. And you can see it's got all these little reflective pads or divots in there. This little guy is not meant to be thrown away. This is a stopper that actually goes in there to help this reflector keep its shape during transport. So don't get rid of that, hang on to it. And right here we can pull out this little pad and there it is, the light itself. So this is the 200D. If you're gonna keep using this box, even though it's not a, um, you know, a sturdy travel case or anything like that. If you want to keep using this box to keep your light safe, when you repack it, push this towards the front and make sure that this is angled towards the front as well, and it'll fit back down in there perfectly. And then on this side, you've got your power box and your head cable. So it's attached to it, it does not come out. This is a three meter cable, so about nine, nine and a half feet. And it comes with this little chain that you can actually hang uh, your, your power box off of your light stand with. But here's the thing, you'll probably never ever actually do that, and here's why. The cable that goes from the power box to the wall is only a meter long, so about three feet. It does not give you a lot of space to move around, and uh, yeah, you'll end up with the, the, the power box on the floor more than anything. Let's dive into the area where it's most apparent when it comes to cost cutting compared to the Lightstorm lineup, build quality. Now the Amarans are mostly plastic construction. That's not to say that they're cheap though. This material feels very rigid and it's, it's stronger than I expected. The main housing, the handle, and the outside of the baby pin receiver are made of plastic, but the inside of the baby pin receiver and the securing screw are metal. So you don't have to worry about your mounting point failing and an accident occurring on set. Some people did manage to crack the plastic casing on the outside of the mount by over tightening the screw. And truth be told, if I hadn't been warned, I probably would have done the same. I tend to over crank things just a, just a little bit, but since I had a heads up, I haven't managed to do this yet, even with having it tight enough to keep it from spinning when it's actually on a stand. The Bowens mount pin on the inside is also metal, so you won't have to worry about any of your accessories falling off. When you loosen the yoke and tilt it, this light makes some squeaks that I've not had in any of my other aperture lights, but generally speaking, I don't think that this is something that would be an issue. Also, this noise basically goes away once you got a soft box on it, so the weight helps make the light quieter. Speaking of soft boxes, yes, the Amaran can very much hold the weight of a light dome or other modifier. The yoke is small, but mighty. The display on the back of the Amaran is not going to win any awards for viewing angles. At a certain point, the screen goes completely black as you tilt the light forward, and then it comes back after that. So not the greatest display in the world, and it's not very bright compared to the light itself, but it's usable. This is the light that we're mostly gonna compare the 200D to. Uh, this is the 300D Mark II, and it's one of Aperture's most popular lights. It's an absolute powerhouse. I love this light. But I wanna show you just how impressive the miniaturization of technology is, because if you want similar output to this light, and you only wanna spend about a third of the cost, this is it. We're talking this much light out of a package this small. And because it shed a little bit of weight due to its compressed size and the plastic housing, it's actually a little bit more comfortable to put this out on the end of a boom arm or to have someone walking around with it and you know do a light on a stick setup and still have a crazy amount of power that you just 
can't do as easily with this, especially if you're like me and your arms are a little noodly. Eventually, I think I'm gonna pick up a 100D and a light dome mini uh, for my live stream setup so I can just clamp it to the wall and get rid of the stand that's taking up floor space right now. These are the two reflectors that you can buy from Aperture as of right now. So on this side, we've got the Hyper Reflector. This is the one that actually ships with the 200D. And then on this side, we have what they call the standard reflector. So the hyper reflector is interesting because it, it, it does create a very bright beam, but the thing is you're gonna have a hot spot in the middle and then it'll kind of fall off a little bit more towards the edges. Whereas this, you don't get that intense brightness at the center of the beam, but you get a more even spread of the light. So it's not to say that one is better or worse than the other. They're different tools for different circumstances, but if you are looking for a very even light, an even hard light across the entire width of the beam, the standard reflector is your go-to. If you're looking to get a very bright spot, then you go for this one. Now these, I think they're about $29 on Aperture's website, so not a bad deal. You can pick up a couple of these, have each of these in your kit for different scenarios uh, without spending too much money, so that's good. One of the other things you'll notice is that the hyper reflector is actually a little bit longer than the standard reflector. So the standard reflector is just a little bit shorter and I don't know exactly how the, the math works out so that this gives you a brighter hotspot in the middle than this, but hey, now you know. Hey, we don't care about all this other stuff. How bright is it? I hear you, all right? Here's the deal. I don't own a light meter yet and I'm not quite sure I trust a phone app to give me accurate results. So instead of going into Lux and Lumens and what have you, I'm going to compare the Amaran 200D to the Lightstorm 300D Mark II. Most people are familiar with that light's output at this point, so a direct comparison should give you an idea of what you're in for with this light. First, we'll look at the 300D at 100% using the hyper reflector. Now, here's the 200D at 100% with the same hyper reflector. The 200D has a tighter spread compared to the 300D. Next up is the 300D with the standard reflector. And here's the 200D with the standard reflector. The beam angle is wider and you don't have as much of an intense hot spot in the center when comparing to the hyper reflector. Now, just like before, it's got a tighter beam angle than the 300D. I'm not a light engineer, but if I had to hazard a guess as to why this is, when you have the reflector on, the 200D's COB sits back a little bit further than the 300D's. Maybe the actual Bowen's mount is acting as a, a snoot of sorts. I don't know. It's just a guess. Now, one thing that I noticed is that the lights don't seem to have the same dimming curve. Now, people have put forth the theory that this is another cost-saving measure, to put a less finely dimmable light engine inside the 200D. The truth is, I don't know, but I do know that 1% on the 200D looks like this, compared to 1% on the 300D, which looks like this. So, just for kicks, I wanted to see what the difference was in the different percentages between the two lights. For this next test, I put the lights side by side and matched the beam angle so that the output was hitting the same amount of wall to even it out. 1% on the 200D is about the same as 9% on the 300D. Stepping up to 25% on the 200D, we've got to go up to 28.3% to match it on the 300. You'll also notice that the hotspot on the 200D is wider than the hotspot on his big brother. 50 on the 200 is equivalent to 49.6 on the 300D, so they're pretty darn close there. And then you get up to 100% with the 300D being just a touch brighter than its little brother. But boy, it's close. Walls, so interesting. But let's go to a shot of these lights being pointed at a face through a light dome. The slight drop in brightness is evident when you switch to the 200D, but you could easily adjust your exposure to compensate for this. While I was shooting, I noticed a bit of a green shift, and when you look at the vector scope in Final Cut with this color chart as a reference, you can see that the greens are more saturated with the 200D. It's not a lot, but it is there. And now we get to the thing that everyone is making much ado over, the fan noise. And I have some thoughts on this, but first I'd like to just show you what it's like in a worst case scenario. For both of these tests, I'm gonna have the Octava MK12 boomed up above me. That's running directly into the camera, the C300 Mark III. I've kept the gain the same in both tests. And on my right for this one, this is the 300D Mark II going through the Aperture Light Dome II with the half stop diffusion. And this is what the room sounds like with that light being the only thing that's making noise in what I would consider a standard interview setup.
On my right, I have the 200D running through the Light Dome 2. It's been running for a little bit to get it up to full operating temperature. And this is what the room sounds like with that light being the only thing that's generating any noise. Now, Aperture pushed out a firmware update that they said was supposed to make the fans quieter and make sure they ran at a constant speed so that the noise was consistent the whole time you had the light on. Here's the fan noise before and after that update. To me, on my unit, it actually sounds a little louder after the update. I've also noticed that the fan noise still isn't consistent and the tone fluctuates back and forth a bit. It's slight, but I was able to hear it. Now, some people said the firmware update actually did fix the issue for them, but on my copy, it's not been much of an improvement. I'd like to take a moment to address something I've seen in one or two other reviews of this light. Now, others have said that the fans are much quieter if you don't go over 40%, but I don't think that's a solution. See, I bought the 200D to push it to the max, not cut it off at the knees and say, oh well, well, where you were a crap giant, you'll make a lovely dwarf. And let me tell you one of the main reasons you want to be able to push your lights as far as you can. Windows. A lot of my shoots involve interviews and rooms just have windows, man. I mean, being able to see out of them adds a lot of depth to your shot. And when you expose for a window, you've just got to add level on the inside. Now this shot you're looking at now was done around midday and to get my key level up where I needed it, I had to bounce two 300D Mark IIs into a book light running at 100%. That's a lot of level to even out my exposure. And if I hadn't been able to use all of my lights capabilities, I would have ended up blowing out that window, which I just hate the look of. Before you type a comment, yes, I know you could gel the windows, but sometimes it's better to just be able to turn up the light instead of working out air bubbles on glass, especially when you're working quickly. So now you know everything that I know about this thing, which means it's time to get to my final thoughts on it. First off, this is a lot of light for the price. Just a few weeks before these were announced, I spent $2,200 on a pair of 300D Mark IIs, and the 200D almost makes me feel like an idiot for making that purchase. Almost. The small size is impressive. Forget the price range that it's in. This is an awesome example of engineering. It's like, it's like an infinity stone. It's tiny and probably capable of killing you with the power it holds inside. That power does come at a cost though. The fan noise is not a deal breaker by any means, but it is a bit of a bummer. I don't know if mine just has a bad fan or if this was just maybe Aperture had to make a compromise in the noise department in the quest for miniaturization. If this isn't what they expected or their test builds didn't have this issue, I'd love to see Aperture offer a, a service program or something for people who didn't get any improvement from the firmware update. Fan noise is one of the main reasons I've stayed away from the Godox and Nanlite fixtures, so this is a little bit disappointing. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't buy one. When I started building my kit six years ago, do you know what you got for $300? This thing. Bestcore made it with hatred and spite in their hearts, and all I know about it really anymore is that the light that it puts out looks terrible. The daylight LEDs look like the green giant sneezed on them, and despite my obsessively being gentle with them, they're just falling apart. And keep in mind, this happened while it was sitting still in a box. If you're just starting to build your kit, the 200D is a fantastic starting point. The fans aren't perfect, and the power cord is hilariously short, but the quality of the light it actually puts out is leaps and bounds ahead of the lights that have been in this price bracket for the last few years. And really, I'm just excited for the people who are about to buy their first light because of the Amaran lineup. I wish so badly that I had been able to buy these when I was starting out, but with this and the 100D, I'm very excited to have a budget option that I can actually recommend to my students and to new creators who don't even know what they don't know yet when it comes to lights. And hey, these aren't bad for permanent installations for home studio work either, which is where they'll probably see the most use in my life. Thank you so much for watching this video all the way to the end. If you like it, hit the thumbs up button. And uh, if you wanna see more about the 200D, we're gonna be doing some tests with the spotlight mount with this. So subscribe if you don't wanna miss that. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on the next one.